Good evening, Sandy Ridge. Good evening to you. Well, welcome back to our Sunday night service. Thank you for attending. Uh, Lord blessed us with some rain, which we desperately needed. And so, uh, but thanks for coming back out as we uh, sing, we pray, and we study his word. And I will start us off tonight with a reading out of Psalm 63. I'll read uh, just a couple of verses here. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. That's the reading of the word of the Lord. Please stand with me and grab your hymn books. We're going to start with number 213, 213, and we'll do all four verses. Let's pray, and then I want to call the mission team up here. Is that what you want to do? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you've given us, and we thank you for loving us. Father, I just thank you that we can come together here this afternoon again and hear your word. Lord, we're just so blessed that we can do that. Lord, as we uh, come together tonight, also, I just ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to your word. And Father, again, I thank you for the opportunities that we have. Thank you for this team that's getting ready to leave in a few days to go to Massachusetts. And I want to pray for the church up there, Pastor uh, Lovelace and his family, a uh, hard area to be ministering in there outside of Boston. Um, I know the building is old, the building's huge, but the sanctuary is not very full. So we just pray that they'll continue to reach the community. And as our team goes over the next week and then the teams that follow us, I just pray, Father, that those people in that small town will wonder why we're there and what we're doing and give us an opportunity to talk to those folks, whoever we meet on the street or in a restaurant or wherever we go. Again, Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. And I ask, Lord, that you continue to love us, meet our needs, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're going to Massachusetts with me, come on up front, please. Uh, I think everybody is here. If you looked in the worship folder, uh, you've seen where Fred and Rose Detweiler were going with us. They are sick. They're not going to be t attending. So it's just going to be nine of us leaving. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who we got missing? Tim's not here. Tim Fox is not here. Okay. <laughs> so everybody's here but Tim. So, okay. Why don't you tell us? Uh, Okay, the church we're going to, the building was built in 1877, but the church was established in 1850. It's First Baptist, Marlboro, Massachusetts. I think from what I talked with the pastor, at one time they were very uh, down to where they only had a few people. And he had went there to plant a church, 
somewhere near the community, and that church grew, and then he went to another church, and then these, his church, the second one, and this one decided to come together because they were meeting in a storefront. So he has been there for, I think, three years, him and his wife and their children, originally from South Carolina. So they are there um, trying to uh, reach this community. Uh, I was having a conversation with Dwayne yesterday, and they were up there, Dwayne and Renee were up there last summer in the main area, Massachusetts area. And of course, June is Gay Pride Month, and it's all over the place up there. So we're going into an area where that is very in your face. And so as we go, we're going to be starting uh, renovations, uh, bathrooms, we know, sanctuary carpet, painting, We'll be the first team. We are the smallest team going. And when we leave, there's four more teams from North Carolina that will be following us to finish, or maybe even do more of what we tear up. Then they'll come in and finish tearing up and start putting back. So uh, basically to help this church. They said that I, I haven't seen the inside, but uh, uh, Helen Helms and her husband, Ed, they've been on, they generally go every year and stay for two or three months wherever we're building at the state of North Carolina Baptist or building. And so we worked with them the last two years in Montana. And so Ed's 87 years old, and he wasn't going this year, but he has committed for five years. So they have seen it. The outside's really pretty. If you've not seen it on the website, look at it. Uh, beautiful building, but she said it's very rough on the inside. So it's a lot of things that need to be done. And you know, uh, one of the things that we're proud of here is our building, right? You know, when somebody comes in, we're proud of what we have. God has blessed us. So that's the whole point is to go and work on this church so they can hopefully get people coming from the community. They are doing VBS this week, so I don't know how many children they'll have, but they do have people to do VBS. So, so you know, we're, we're not a business. We're not a build it and they will come kind of model. So we understand there are certain th assumptions when we exist from week to week. One of the assumptions is we believe that people still want to find a good church and however they define that. And we believe that oftentimes they'll try a new church. So that's the front door. The front door is a number of things. It's whether or not your facilities look nice. It's whether or not your website is updated. I checked out a church's website in town here today. It's amazing. And it hasn't been updated since April. Getting an, a website is the easiest thing a church can do. Keeping it looking like they pay attention to it is probably one of the hardest. Buying property is one of the easiest things you can do. Keeping it looking nice is one of the hardest things you can do. Of course, we can all bear witness to that. So the basic thing people come to church for is to maybe, maybe hear a well-known speaker. So that's one strike against you. Um, the other is that they have a nice-looking place. We do. And uh, that's why we hound Garrett consistently. And because we, he's such good at it, we want to make sure that our place continues to look nice and buildings and grounds. And it's just the, the other thing is our website. Uh, but friends usually get others to go to church with them. Think about Adam and Haley here. They, they come because they work with the, with the, the Poovies and the, Sw and the Swansons. And so here's people that come uh, because they were invited. So that's the front door. And we know once someone comes in, there are other things that keep them wanting to continue their attendance with you. One of them is whether or not anyone talks to them. I'm still amazed that people that when they come to our church, they say they've been to many others. I think, Linda, you might have told me this, Linda Kirkendall, that in fact, you went to several churches, they didn't even talk to you. Well, part of the problem is that their people are there so seldom, they couldn't know a guest if it smacked them in the forehead. They're not sure who's a guest because they're there every second or third or fourth Sunday and they have one service a week. And so by the time you see someone, you're there one out of nine services, one out of three weeks, whatever it is. So you don't know who's a visitor. So you can't be friendly to people because you're not sure who to be friendly to. And you don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to say, hey, you new here? Oh, <laughs> well, you would think I was. You know, so there's a ton of things that are turnoffs to people. Well, one of them is facilities. So we're not naive enough to think that fixing up a church building will make a congregation. What we are pretty informed on though is that if a person visits your church and when they step in the bathroom the floor sags like a hammock they're probably not coming back that's easy math isn't it so we're not saying that this builds a congregation we're saying that it reduces the likelihood of simple little nasty things keeping people from coming back 
So that's what we're trying to do is remove obstacles for people and their walk with God through a local church. So uh, that's what we're, no, nope, you get, <laughs> yeah, short, short and sweet. One of the things I want you to know is the mission committee met Tuesday night. If you're a part of giving to our 1052 mission fund, that helps us to go. That will help some with scholarships to go, but also we voted to take $3,000 check with us to give to the church. Now, will we see what that money goes to? Maybe we won't, but we have a part in what's taking place there. Okay, so why don't we get you close together here and kind of huddle up. Now, I've heard from many of you that you have been vaccinated, and we know that the vaccination keeps you uh, safe from all viruses, and so you're good. <laughs> so if you'd like to join me at, <laughs> relax, all right. If, you, if you'd like to come up and join with me, then pray for them. Come right now, and let's put hands on these friends, and let's, uh, hands not around the neck, but on the back. Come on, come on, friends, don't be bashful. We need people praying. And um, get on behind them if you need to on the steps. If you'd like to be a part of this, um, then we will pray one for the other. And yeah, of course, they're going to be in a van together. Let's pray that they stay healthy. Okay. Well, that's a good crowd. All right. Very good. Brother Andrew Call, I'm going to ask you to start us off. I'm going to hand you this microphone. And then I'm going to ask you to pass it over to Keith. All right, Keith, when you're done, I'd like you to hand it over to Dwayne. Close us out, okay, in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this team that you have put together. Lord, we trust in your sovereignty, and we know that uh, we will send them away with the Holy Spirit within them and going before them, making their way straight. Lord, we pray that you would uh, put the wind at their backs and make their trip and ease and success, and we pray even foremost that you would go ahead and soften a heart to open a mind, to open the hearts there in Massachusetts that they will be receiving the word of the gospel that comes to them from this church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we've are from a church that sends missions out. We thank you for these that are going to Massachusetts, and we ask that you give them safe travel. Lord, we ask that uh, you prepare them for whatever they have, whatever is ahead of them, that the work they do is, is multiplied through your Holy Spirit. Lord, that uh, most of all that they reach and touch someone that doesn't know you. Lord, it's, we remember those, that day that you come in our heart. And for what, and for people that, like these people here that cared and went out and served you by introducing the gospel, we would be lost. Lord, I ask that you would just uh, bless them for their efforts. And most of all, Lord, have, help them to receive a blessing while they're gone. Lord God, I just thank you for these folks who have given up our time to go and serve you, Lord, and serve your people. Lord, we're very aware that your church is your people and that your church is worldwide, whether we be here at Sandy Ridge or up in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Lord, we know the need is great up there in New England. Lord, we know that that's where the evangelistic effort early in the 1800s originated in our country, and now, Lord, they are in sore, sore need of your precious and holy word. Lord, as these emissaries of our church, our local church, go up there, Lord, be with them. I pray that they would carry your divine will, that they would do your divine will. Lord, that you would just bless everything that they do. May their fellowship with each other be sweet. May their fellowship with fellow believers up there be sweet, and that you would be honored that you'd be high and lifted up in everything that's done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for taking part in that, church. All right. It's time to hear the Faulkner sing. It's 
And, they, and, and we're, and we're going to hear three of them sing this time. I saw the way Gabriel was looking at his mom. That was neat. We're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and that is, if you need your pew Bible, that is page 1405, 1402 rather. Brother Ronnie will come and read, and then Frankie will bring us the uh, lesson slash sermon for this evening. He's bringing it on a controversial topic. And so I hope that you will be ready with your questions. Now, we're going to do a particular format to help my dear brother out, and that's going to be the you wait until the end format. And, um, and so uh, he has been given a time limit, and then I'll come up and play referee and field your questions if you have any. Would you stand and introduce these folks standing or sitting with you? <laughs> Welcome. We're glad you're here. Wonderful. 
That sounds like fabulous babysitting arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Ronnie, would you come and read the scripture to us? Here's your microphone. And uh, then Frankie, we're almost on time. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that all the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so? that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between the, his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covets, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Thanks, brother. Um, I'd like to read one portion again because we're going to emphasize one specific word out of these 11 verses. Then I'll pray and we'll begin. So if you look back again, chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, which is where we're going to settle tonight, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Father, you are good. Amen. You are wise beyond our comprehension. Tonight, Lord, I pray that you would use me to be a communicator for you, for your word, being honest to the text. I pray that you'd open our hearts to see what you have to say to us through Paul, through Moses, through me, that you would move me out of the way, remove our distractions, that we would be focused on your word and not the color of the carpet or Facebook, but Lord, that we would be focused specifically on your truth and the matters that you have for us tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all of these things, for your word and for your sanctification, your washing, your justification in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Lord, we thank you for all of these things. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> so I already said that our focus tonight is going to be specifically from verse 9. Our word that we're going to focus on, you might have homosexual, you might have catamite, you might have buggerer if you're using a really old translation. Uh, if you're using New King James, it should be sodomite. The Greek word there is arsenokoitai, okay? And arsenokoitai comes from two Old Testament words. And we're going to flip there in just a second. But our focus needs to be here because sexual immorality, this homosexuality is a crux of our passage. A crux, a crux, a focus for us. And it's a focus for us because it's a focus on our culture. Seemingly, sexual immorality is not only rampant among our culture, but 
is being pushed down our throats. So this is something that not only should we talk about, we should have an apologetic for, but we should understand exactly what Scripture says and not what culture says about it. So I, I want to show you that, like I said, in spite of what the culture says, the Bible speaks directly to this. The Bible speaks clear about this topic. The Bible speaks clear for us to apply how we act in regards to people who struggle with homosexuality, who, who, who uh, towards people who struggle with sexual immorality in general. So this passage is going to help us wade through some of those topics. So I'm going to continue to speak, but if you guys will go ahead and flip to Leviticus 20, verse 13. Leviticus 20, verse 13. This word, arsenikoitai, um, is a very interesting word. Uh, the reason that I say that it's from Leviticus 20:13, an Old Testament couple sets of words, is that Paul actually makes this word up for us. He coins this phrase, and it's only used in one other passage that Bill has already preached on. So arsenikoitai is found twice in the New Testament. It's not found in the Old Testament, not because it's Greek and the Old Testament is Hebrew, but because Paul has to combine two Hebrew words from Leviticus 20, verse 13, to help us understand exactly what he's talking about. So, as far as Paul is concerned, his making up of the word is not something that he just simply does for the fun of it. Paul is making up this word by the inspiration of the Spirit, right? God empowers Paul with a wisdom and an understanding to give us our synechoitai. He says, not he says, but God allows Paul to pin this with his own craftsmanship, with his own creativity, specifically by the power of the Spirit. So throughout time, like, we can see that this word continues to be in our Bibles from the first and second century is copies that you can Google and look up and find arsenikoitai written right there. You can see it in our Bible. When we go to Bible tags or we use another app, we can see the sentence structure that's here in our Bible today in Greek because the Lord has preserved his word for us so that we might utilize it in an accurate way. That way we don't have confusion. That way we're not like, well, maybe God said this back in the old times and Maybe 50 years ago it was totally different. Maybe in 100 years it'll be totally different. No. The Lord is preserving his word throughout time. We have copies of the originals that we can literally Google image, which I did this week. You can go and type in this word, find it online, not just through Andy's app, but actually see the papyrus there. God has preserved his word throughout time for us to be able to use. And not only that, but as far as the meaning is concerned... Arsenikoitai has remained the same throughout the ages. So when we see this word translated as, again, homosexual, buggerer, sodomite, uh, catamite, whatever else you guys have there, we see that the principal definition of this word is still the same when Paul penned it and when Moses wrote down his words that Paul uses to coin this phrase. So all that to be said... Let's read our verse, Leviticus 20, verse 13, and we'll point out exactly where we find this. Again, Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's it. It says that a man who lies with a woman, or with a man like a woman, that's where we get our word for homosexual. A man who lies with a man like a woman. Our words here, man better, man B-E-D-D-E-R, not man better, but man better, right? So it's the same concept as what we would see between a righteous covenant marriage relationship, but is perverted between two men. That's why we have homosexual. That's why we have buggerer. That's why we have catamite. All of these words, right, portray and uh, actually communicate the same exact principle. That's why we can say that without a doubt, arsenikoitai has meant the same thing since Paul penned it because he gets it from Moses, and Moses, again, 
as well as Paul, gets it directly from the Spirit, inspired by God for us to communicate his law and his agenda for creation. So that way it works correctly and rightly. And we can then communicate correctly and rightly what is good and what is right according to God. So let's flip back over to 1 Corinthians 5. Flip back over to 1 Corinthians 5, not 6, because we're going to start, again, getting some context and building up to our word. Again, I said before, the context of 5 and 6 and even into 7 of 1 Corinthians is a context of sexual immorality. What we're seeing is that Paul is addressing sin among them and starting with a heterosexual sin. A man and a woman in the camp, right? A man who has his mother's wife. Father's wife. Thank you. There's a lot of men and women going on here. (laughs) His father's wife. That a man has his father's wife. He starts off with something that we can identify with. That 98% of the population can identify with. That can say, look, this is something that we say is wrong. Not only that, but Paul says in verse 5 or excuse me, chapter 5, even the Gentiles, even the Gentiles look down upon this sin. We see that specifically, let's see, oh. One. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. There it is, not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. You see, if Paul is addressing this here, Paul is not only addressing heterosexual sin, he's addressing homosexual sin, he's addressing any kind of sexual immorality amongst the Corinthian people. He does it more in later chapters of Corinthians because that is essentially what man, this book is about, is wrongful worship being corrected by Paul so that they can rightly address God. So what we're seeing is that Paul is not discriminating against one type of sin. He's not, he's not sitting here calling out homosexuality because Paul's not gay, right? But because the Corinthian church is ripe with all kinds of nasty things that, like I said, even the Gentiles look down upon. They tolerated it, right? They tolerated it. It's not that they were like, Uh, well, that guy's doing something weird over there with that girl. Or, man, they're kind of doing something weird, those two guys over there. He's saying, no, that's, that's okay that they're doing that. We don't really mind all that much. And it could be, it could be that they tolerated it because they were involved in it. It could be, very well could be. So they kept on eating. They kept on eating and partying it up. They had a good time with these people. They even continued to worship with them. No one bats an eye when practicing sin is brought into the camp. Paul even has to tell them what marriage looks like in chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. We're not going to flip there yet. But he has to tell them, look, you're practicing so much sexual immorality. You're perverting what marriage looks like so much that you've forgotten what it actually is. And you have to be reminded so much so that you may not even acknowledge it to know exactly what it is. So we see that Paul calls us to not eat or fellowship with these people. We're going to look at uh, 5 9 here for a second. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. That's 5.9. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. We have an obligation to act accordingly to sin that is in our midst. And Paul tells us explicitly that those who are committing sin but claiming the brotherhood, not to keep company with them, not to eat with them, because the leaven that they bring 
destroys the rest of the loaf. The leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Stick with these things. Keep the feast, not with old leaven, verse 8 of chapter 5. Do not continue to be found with these things. Cast out those amongst you who are performing and practicing this type of sin or these types of sins. And when sin is found in the flock, it ruins the whole flock unless you remove it completely. It ruins the flock by reputation and it ruins them by further poisoning the entirety of the flock. You may not be affected by it immediately, but if we continue to tolerate it, it continues to build and to grow unless you get rid of all of it. Even when good is being done inside the camp by those people, or if someone is continuing to practice sin and we aren't just celebrating it, but we're allowing it to move forward, we continue to be complicit in that sin. Don't turn, don't turn to Joshua 7, but I want to remind you of the story of Achan. When Achan is found to have disobeyed God, maybe for the sake of his family, something good and noble and honest, kind of, he spoils all of the accomplishments that the Israelites had. He disobeys God directly. It's, it's not that God's anger just arose against Joshua as the leader because of his mismanagement or just Achan for actually committing the sin of theft and disobedience, but against all of Israel. The whole camp had to be cleansed because of his sin, and Achan and his family died for it. That's why in 5.8, Paul says not to be with the leaven of wickedness and malice, or you will also be corrupted, and no longer be unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, but you will continue in the leaven of malice and wickedness. This is why we cast out those among us who practice sin blatantly, and claim to be a part of the brotherhood. That distinction there is super important. To be in the brotherhood, practicing of sin, and claiming sainthood. So we'll talk about a little bit more what that looks like, because Paul talks a little bit more about what that looks like. But that distinction has to be made in how we're, we're dealing with sin amongst us. It has to be made, because we're not here to judge the entirety of the world, right? Right? We're here to judge, to some degree, those among us. To at least do something so that the Lord will act in accord. And he gives us the process by which to do it. Cast them out. So that their flesh may be destroyed and sent to Satan. So that their soul might be saved in the end. Bill. Oh, man, you're great. Verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We have an obligation to act accordingly when sin is found among us. If Jesus, through Paul, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, God, through Paul, tells us to cast them out, if we recognize that this is God's word inspired, penned down, we have to do something about that. Not just do something about that in the like general sense, but we do something about it by obeying it or rejecting it as God's word. And then, then we have our own issues. We have our own issues when we reject a certain portion of Scripture just because it might say, in my opinion, or I say to do this, or I think it's best when you do this. But when we reject these things, we have to make that choice. We can either reject it and be in uh, not submission to God's word, or we can be in submission to God's word. Whatever the scripture leads. Whatever the scripture leads. And that's again why church discipline is also important. And, and a loving thing to do. We forget far too often that when we discipline someone, it just seems so mean. But... As we see from verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It might look mean, but it is God's plan to save them. When we bench somebody, we're saying you're a problem not only to them, but to the whole camp. That's why we continually kill our own sin. 
that our souls might be saved. Sometimes this is a, a habit, an affiliation, man, a shopping habit, a spending habit, a person habit, a, a person, whatever it is. If it causes us to sin, we cut it off. And if it's sin and we support it, we don't link arms with it. And we certainly don't gradually cut it off. Jesus isn't like, well, when you sin, your hand causes you to stumble. You take a pinky off first and then your ring finger and then your middle finger, especially that one, and then your pointer finger, and then your thumb. No, no, no. He says, cut the whole thing off right away. Get it out. Cleanse the camp. And when we don't cut it out, look at what 6.9 says. Go there. Don't be deceived. 6.9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, so on and so forth. Do not be deceived, meaning that those who were of the brotherhood could be deceived by their own sin, and those who cast out or practiced sin were already deceived. What were they deceived from? Doing the very basic functions of the church. That's what, again, like I said, Corinthians is about. How do you do the basic functions of these things? How can I continue to teach you what's going on? Because you've been deceived, or those among you are being deceived. Paul's saying that you don't know how to have practice. Paul is saying that you don't know how to practice your giftings or the functions of the local body because you're committing sin and it's getting in the way of those gifts. And in 6.15 to the end of the chapter, Paul says they, they can't even get marriage right. Like we've already said, they can't even get it right. And even if they acknowledge it, he's still got to explain how to acknowledge it and what it means on a deeper level. All types of sin deceive us, period. When we continue to practice, when we continue to tolerate, our judgment and our function and our giftings in the body are clouded when we do not cleanse ourselves. And it's not a cleansing of ourselves. Let me be clear in that. It is a cleansing of the Spirit. 5.1 and 6.11, I'll read those quickly. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, 611. These are linked together. I'm going to tell you why. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We're called to act differently. You see, the Gentiles looked down upon them because they were actually acting worse than the Gentiles. But verse 11 says that some, and such were, some of you. Now you can emphasize all of those, right? And such were some of you. And such were some of you. And it is so important that we recognize at least the were part of that. We, we represent Christ because of what he has done for us. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Spirit resides inside of us. Such were some of you. We represent him because of what he's done for us. It is a different ethic that God calls us to all together. It's not because homosexuality doesn't reproduce. It doesn't. Or heterosexual sin may lead to other types of deformity. It can. But because God has set limits and God has spoken what is good and what is right. Instead of a utilitarian, like what is good and best at the time, uh, or, or doing things from an evolutionary standpoint, like what can get me more stuff or, or spread my progeny the most, which are both heretical. We claim a new and washed ethic that sets aside those things, that uses the text of God's word to lead us to look different from the culture. We're emphasizing the were here because God has called us to something radically different, not just, not just heterosexuality, not just being straight, right? But being straight and being righteous in the eyes of God. 
we are called not to just be utilitarian. It's not that God's word is simply the better way to live. Because if you follow God's word, you'll be blessed, you'll, you'll have more money, this, that, and the other, right? It's not just because of some of these promises that God has given us, but because he is the giver of life. He is the one who washes. He is the one who sanctifies and justifies us and gives us these things for his glory and his namesake. These are not just an approach that says, God, give me all the stuff you got. Save me so I can give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. No, 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 no. We're doing these things because the Lord has changed us, has washed us, has justified us, and has called us to something radically different. What is that radically different? Look at verse 9. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, thieves, covets, drunkards, revilers. Man, it looks like he's covering a lot of stuff, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The inverse here is that there is hope for everyone who believes in Christ, period. There is not a single sin or something that Christ has not forgiven his people of, period. If Christ can change the man who loves himself or hates God or steals from sick, disabled, poor puppies, then through the power of the Spirit, every man can repent and have peace with God and be made into something that was a were. That's not a pronoun that you can identify with like we do today, but it is a state of being because we no longer want to do these things. We were these things, and now Christ has transformed us into something new. There is hope here for the murderer, the pedophile, the furry, that's 21st century young lingo, the liar, the drunkard, the rapist, the woman who gets an abortion, the man who transitions to pretending to be a woman. There is hope for everyone who comes to Christ, regardless of where or how or why they mutilate any part of their body or what they do to someone else. Paul was a murderer. He wrote most of our New Testament. The Lord forgave him, right? We heard this morning, divorced men, right? The Lord forgives. And there's hope for everyone who comes to Christ and repents of their sins. And it's only because God's word is clear about the blood of the cross atoning for any and all kinds of sin. I want to pray. But I, I, I want you to take away that fact that there is hope for absolutely every single person who has committed a homosexual act, any of the other things on this list. And if that is truly you in this space and you have not repented of these things, now is the time you are called to live differently. If you struggle with a normative sexual sin, it is still a sin according to God. Let me pray. Father, I ask tonight that you would give us clarity amongst your word. I hope that I have communicated that. I pray that you would use my words, regardless of how imperfect or sped up or whatever they are, Lord, I pray that you would use them you would change our hearts. You would change our attitude to love. You would change our attitudes to share your gospel. You would change our minds and our hearts to look more like you. I pray these things for the glory of your name and your son. Amen. Amen. Well done, Frankie. Thank you. So uh, let's talk. Let's, let me sort these out for us if we could. Who has questions about anything that he dealt with in the text itself? Anyone have any questions about anything that he dealt with in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6? Phil? All right, so how did Paul make the word up? Yeah, so if you were to go back to Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a wo woman. So what Paul is doing here is combining a couple of those words, man bedding, to get arsenokoitai. So in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, he combines those two words there 
and gets arsenokoitai. So if you, if you step in front of someone in uh, the lunchroom and take their seat, how long before you're known as the seat taker? Same, same idea, making yeah. a word up based on someone's actions, yep. their habitual uh, practice. Yep. Is there another question you have? Dot? Can I turn on this? Yeah, I do. All right. Bill's going to tell me if it's correct, though. I don't think we turned it on. Oh, we? no. All right. Just give him your spelling, brother. Okay. <laughs> My spelling. Arsenokoitai, A-R-S-E-N-O-K-O-I-T-I. Arsenokoitai. Did I just win the spelling bee? Yep. Good. Andy. Andy? Yes. <laughs> Well, if, so I have thought about this. I have thought about this. <laughs> uh, if life is found within Christ, and Christ is the head of the body, and we are the body of Christ, um, life is found here. Life is found amongst his people, and his word, and the preaching and teaching of it, and the receiving of it. And to be cast out from it is to bring death and destruction upon oneself. And so as we begin to implement that form of judgment, upon someone, we're saying, be destroyed in that way. That's at least my opinion. For further reading, I recommend the closing verses of 1 Timothy 1, where Paul recommends, uh, where he told that he turned people over for the destruction, over to Satan, yeah. that they learned not to blaspheme. That's good. It seems like uh, at some point, not being a part of a local church like Corinthian church, uh, not being a part of it is, in fact, making you vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. Yeah. That's what the, the, the teaching of the text says. So, I love Jesus, I'm just not a part of a church, is a great way to get hammered by Satan. Yeah. I mean, hammered. And now, I mean, your Christian friends, they're not going to tell you that. They're going to say stuff like, oh, you know, Job went through trouble, blah, blah, blah. Mark her down. By the time you get to heaven, it'll be totally clear to you that you have brought that on yourself. Is there another question from the text? Anything else? Okay, let's handle it topically. Is there anything that you felt like was um, an, um, uh, an implication of what he preached or taught tonight? You want to ask a question. Charles? I think, you know, when we, when we often hear that all sin... It wasn't a question. It was, <laughs> oh, a, no. it was a comment that, uh, that the Lord said that this kind of practice was an abomination in the book of Leviticus. Yeah. And Frankie is commenting on it. Yeah. So uh, I think that when we hear that all sin is the same, we see clear indicators that all sin equally offends God, but some sin deserve or are allowed to be punishable by a certain... And different consequence. And as other passages of Scripture say that uh, certain things are an abomination, the land will spew them out, right? These things that are worthy of death, man, I mean, it's not for us to judge what God does to or for these sins. So um, I've got a question for you on yeah. that. Uh, if Leviticus was written, say, 1406 B.C., somewhere around that, sure. could take a year or two. Sure. Uh, what tells us that God hasn't maybe changed his mind in 1,500 years when Paul wrote his books? I mean, how do we know that Paul's not just being, you know, Paul? Because there's a lot, to, a lot of people have problems with Paul. Sure. Uh, how do we know that God himself hasn't changed his mind? And... Uh, how would you address that if I was an antagonist working with you and I thought, you know, you're just being selective. 
There's a lot of things in Leviticus that we don't go to. Sure. You know what? I think you already made the right, the right uh, Frankie, let me help you. Seriously, you already made the right argument. Yeah. You went, you, the first thing you did tonight was show us that Paul formed his argument out of Leviticus. Yeah. He made up a word. And if it wasn't authoritative, we got a problem with an apostle of Jesus Christ. Right? Right. Yeah, stand behind that. Yeah. You did a good job. Well, and I would add, too, that Paul's consistent throughout his writings. Mm-hmm. Right? So I just flipped to Romans 1. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's evident throughout creation that these things are not only an abomination, but a twisting of Scripture. So Paul is not only just arguing from Old Testament law, but he's arguing, again, from creation. All right. Thank so you. next yeah. question. Darren, go ahead. Exactly the same. Do you want to? I'm oh, sorry. The I'm jumping the gun. You, so. you, you are twice the in a row. I have overstepped no, my no, bounds. No, 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 no. You're the preacher. <laughs> Good question, Darren. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think praying in the similar way that the Lord would bring the righteous about, that the land might be changed or spared, and if not, and the Lord does not see fit that He would spare His people and spare a remnant, um, that He would. Not that we're praying to bring down fire on all the gays, right? That's not us. That's not what God calls us to do. But God does tell us that we should continuing to be evangelized, to be praying for all kinds of men. So let's talk about that. No, the Lord doesn't call us to call down fire on the homosexuals, but he does call us, as was preached out of the passage today, our camp is the church. Yeah. And our job is not to make all the social ills right, all the moral ills right. Our job is to keep the church right. Mm. So while we're busy talking about America, getting things wrong at the White House and everywhere else, how about we fix our own acreage? Sure. That's good. You know, let's mow our own front lawn before we get on Biden's case. When we've got immorality in our own churches and then we want to talk about Democrats being a problem, Democrats ain't an issue. We got all kinds of issues. You know what? The homosexuals didn't take over marriage. We knew the heterosexuals getting divorced for about 50 years before that started happening. Yeah. yeah. Say amen right there. <laughs> or ouch. Heterosexuals are messing up marriage a yeah. lot longer before the homosexuals got a right to get married. Mm. I'm not for a homosexual marriage, but I just think we ought to be honest enough to say that uh, we got to get the sump pump working in our own basement before we want to clean everyone else's stuff. Is that Southern enough, Rick? That's good. Is That's there good. one more question? Go ahead, Andrew. We got Andrews everywhere. If we could get a few more of you, that'd be really good. We got about four of you. Go ahead, Andrew. No, I don't think so. I don't think that there is a distinction between the two that are listed there. The reason why the wording's a little different is because in the last verse of the chapter, you might notice in some publishers it's italicized, which is usually the publisher trying to help you out that Paul is quoting an Old Testament verse. Hmm. So what Paul is doing again in his writing is he's quoting the very Old Testament that you're not supposed to be believing anymore. Of course, I'm saying that in jest. Of course, you're supposed to believe it. And he quotes Deuteronomy 17, yeah. and he says that you're supposed to remove the professed brother. Mm. Uh, you might notice in chapter 5 and verse number 10, he says, don't eat with a person, verse number 9, don't eat with a person who is immoral and claims to be a brother. 
You see in verse 11, he makes a differentiation. I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who's sexually immoral. Whereas in verse 10, he says, that's impossible in a world filled with immorality. Do you see how he has a higher standard? He doesn't say, hey, run from the wicked people in the world. He says, run from the person who says they're a believer who's wicked. Hmm. Do you see that? So our concern should be about the people in this room. Hmm. And then you might notice the last verse of the chapter, he actually tells us to judge people, right? And hmm. Frankie made an, um, alluded to that. So we're trying to make sure that every one of us has a life that's glorifying to the Lord. That's right. Well, wow, not only did you do well, but you got in under the time limit. I'm super impressed. Well done. Should we stand together? <laughs> and if Frankie is encouraged, remember, you voted to, to license him last September. If you see progress and you're thankful for what God is doing and developing his gift, come and encourage him after uh, the service, after we dismiss. All right, I'd like to call on Brother Michael Faulkner. Usually we don't hear from you because for some reason we never get a microphone next to you when you're playing the piano. So I'm going to ask you to close our service in prayer tonight.